All right, good morning everyone and hi to everyone in Perth as well. We're 11 o'clock in Melbourne and some of you are watching from overseas, so it's really, really exciting. Um, we are going to run for an hour today, roughly, give or take, not really sure, because um, we're just gonna have a live conversation, obviously, where I ask Holly a, a number of questions and, and um, we get straight into the nitty gritty of, of what this conversation is about. Um, what we both are here to do is to help parents have a conversation with their kids around pornography if they haven't already it's vital that you do so and it does not matter how old they are and and holly's going to get get into that in a sec um i get a lot of teens contacting me so i'm going to um jump on the back of what holly's saying and i'm going to extend that to how the brain actually works what a porn addiction is and um, we're going to get into some stats today that are pretty frightening so there is a little bit of a warning that comes with this that you will hear some stuff today that is not nice but this is what we deal with every single day people don't believe us when we talk about this stuff um, and it's really really important that um, you get your head around it first before your kids already have addictions I have 13 year olds on Instagram 12 to 17 year olds contacting me every single day I can't treat them legally I can't do anything about it um, they can only read my free resources and these kids have even have Facebook page, um, Instagram pages around this uh, addiction that they already have at 13. So you need to listen to this. And if you think that your kids aren't even being exposed to porn, then think again. It's really, 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 really important that you have this conversation with them and that you understand what a porn addiction is. And that's why we're teaming up today to get you to understand um, it's not just from the moral side of things and that that's not real sex and things like that. You, you need to understand what this is doing to, to men later on in life. Okay. Um, you can ask questions all the way through. We're not going to have the chance to actually read those until the end. Um, so we will, if we can go through the comments section on our phones and actually check because um, we're, Zoom, we're um, streaming from Zoom today. So we will check the comments and the questions. If you have any questions, pop them in there. If we can't get them today, get to them today, we'll actually jump on another live and answer those for you. Um, there will be resources today that both Holly and I have that we can give you. I have a free ebook, so stay tuned for those. We will discuss those right at the end and you'll have links in the comments um, as well. So uh, we'll get Holly to introduce herself today and tell us what she does and, and who she works with and how long she's been doing it for. Over to you, Holly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this. Um, we are both so passionate about keeping kids safe and I come to it from um, working with children. I stand in front of roughly, um, the, uh, sorry, 4,000, 4,500 kids every year from three to 17. Um, I teach a child abuse prevention program and what I'm seeing and hearing in classes um, has really been concerning me over the years and it's getting worse and worse. So um, I say that we need to have the conversation about pornography when children are six. And I say this because when I'm working with a class of children, I can tell who's already seen it. And um, Catherine, I'll just share a, a story to emphasize this with you. I was in a, a school here in, in Perth and I had 32 seven-year-olds and we were doing the public and private lesson, which is one of the 10 lessons that I do with kids in, in classes based on protective education. And we talk about private body parts. So that's where I incorporate pornography. I call them private pictures and private movies when I'm talking with six year olds, I don't actually call it pornography. Mm. Um, and I was doing the lesson with the children. And when we got to the part about where can you see private pictures and private movies, the kids put up their hand and say Snapchat, um, you know, Instagram, they, they know it all, YouTube always, children tell me at grandma's house and that was a recent you know that's been a recent thing and I hadn't thought of that but of course parents some parents have filtering but grandparents don't have filtering so they're watching it at grandparents houses um, I had a young uh, fella say on a plane and then I hadn't thought about that one and then a week wow. later I was on a plane sitting next to a guy watching Game of Thrones so yes you can see it on a plane <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, But when I did the lesson with the children and YouTube always comes up um, and we both know how much, you know, pornography is on YouTube and they're targeting where children go. So they're putting it in, you know, Minecraft videos and, and funny cat videos and 
you know, if a, a little six-year-old girl Google, uh, sorry, YouTube, put in Elsa from Frozen, yeah, eventually yeah. she's going to come across a video with Elsa and Spider-Man having sex and having twins. Yeah. So we had this great discussion with the children and then it's recess time. So I'm standing in the doorway, letting the kids go out to play saying, you know, thanks for coming. That was, you know, brilliant. Um, you know, have a good day. And eight children of the 32 seven-year-olds stayed behind. Mm. And when I said, kids, go out to play, they said, no, miss, we need to see you. And each child had come up one at a time um, privately telling me how they had seen pornography on YouTube. Yeah. But one child had told a parent and for fear of getting into trouble or having the device taken away. Now that's, you know, that's a small sample, 32, seven, but that's a mm. quarter of seven year olds. Mm. Mm. And, you know, I'm hearing this when I'm standing in front of so many children, it's not just, you know, a few, like you said, you're getting hundreds of, of teens contacting yeah. you. I'm having lots of children or, you know, you'll just see that they don't even need to say it. You'll just see them fidget on a seat or show you in their body language yeah. that, that they, or their eyes light up going, yes, miss, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. Someone understands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I give them the, the language around this, they are absolutely so grateful. Mm. And that particular school, I was fortunate to do a workshop that evening and got to say to the parents, you know, this is what this is what your children are telling me. They're too scared to tell you because you'll take their device away, or they're too scared to tell you because they think they'll get into trouble. Yeah. And it's the shame around it. Even at six and seven, mm. they still know that that what they've seen is um, harmful, and they they don't know how to deal with it. But children are describing to me flashbacks yeah. and nightmares. Yeah. So, you know, and, and mm. parents won't know why they they're, they're okay. having that response. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just introduce myself now. I'm Catherine Lyle from Integrated Men's Health and I am a kinesiologist, intuitive healer, massage therapist, uh, transformational coach, uh, psycho-spiritual um, therapist. I'm an author and I also train people in the modalities that I do. So I work with men very, very closely in terms of the body, um, the systems and, you know, and how the, and the brain and the cellular memory and all of that stuff, right? So I'm not just a therapist. I'm not a psychologist that's just sitting down with men and having a conversation with them about this. I have seen the evidence of this porn addiction for years and years and years and years now. And that's why I specialize in it because I started treating men and I had no idea this was out there. Um, in my personal life, I kind of was exposed to it, but it wasn't until I changed one little tick box on my form, my intake form that said, do you watch porn? And everything changed. Every single man was ticking it. Um, and 95% of my clients, and they don't all come to me for porn addiction, have erectile dysfunction. So I'm going to go into that now. I'm going to talk to you about a few stats, stats around kids as well um, and what we're actually seeing in society. And this is what my new book is about. So Pornhub um, is only one site, right? Just keep that in mind when I read this stat to you. There are plenty of other porn sites as well as all of this free stuff on Google that doesn't take you to you know, any site in particular. So Pornhub got 5 billion, not million, billion more hits than last year, not in total than the year before. Um, that's 13.7 million hits per day, right? More than the previous year. It's not even in total, right? 97% of men are watching porn regularly, according to my survey results a year ago. That those stats, I'm very pleased to say, have changed to 87%, and and we've seen that go. Oh, so two over two years, we've seen that change, which is amazing. 95% um, of the men, as I say, um, said before that I see have erectile dysfunction. 50% of them actually don't know that it exists because they're never masturbating without porn. Right? So they're always under the influence of porn and they have been since they were young. Uh, so they don't actually know organically, apart from having sex occasionally with their wife and it all going you know, a little bit strange, not being able to keep erections, things like that. Um, when they go to actually masturbate without porn, they cannot arouse themselves at all whatsoever. So it's really, really high percentage. It's not one in five men that you'll see the stats out there on, in the news and things like that. Um, I've only ever met 20 men, it's 21 now actually, that have never watched porn. 
right? That, that's in my whole career. Um, and when we say never watch it, they've seen it, someone's emailed them something or whatever, but they don't watch it regularly and they don't masturbate to it. And there's only been 20 of those, okay? 100% of men that watch porn regularly will have brain damage from the addiction. And we're gonna get, get to that in a sec and how that actually works. 91% of men, according to my research, are masturbating and watching porn for reasons other than pleasure. 91%. So they're masturbating because they're bored, they're stressed, they're tired, they're hungover, um, the wife isn't home, you know, it's just what they do before sleep, that type of thing, right? So they, these are straight from the men. I didn't make these stats up. The average lifespan of a porn star is age 35. Why? Because they all kill themselves. All right, so the industry, we're not going to get into the industry today and the sex trafficking and all of those things, but there's a massive issue out there that goes beyond um, just, you know, people watching porn, right? You've got to think of what's happening on the other end of that industry. 93% um, of boys under the age of 18 have all seen porn. I, I would actually question that and say that it's actually higher. 50% uh, of those boys are watching porn and masturbating every single day. All right? And that this was taken a couple of years ago. So I would question that, that it's higher than that as well. A quarter of kids under the age of eight, which is what you were just talking about, have seen pornography. Under the age of eight, the, the actual ages are zero to eight for that stat, okay? Uh, child on child sex abuse has increased to over 400% in Australia. And it, that was in 2016. So it's a lot higher than that now. 56% increase on sexual injuries reported to GPs by young girls. Now they are the only ones that are, they're just the ones that are reported. Okay. So there's a massive, massive epidemic of sexual injuries in, in young girls. It's just horrendous. Uh, sexual offenses have doubled, right? The reported ones. One in five rapes is committed by a juvenile. So these kids, the child-on-child -child sex abuse, are actually acting out on other children and then they're, you know, the, the sexual violence escalates and then they start raping women because that's what they're seeing on porn. One in four young men believe that it's normal for men to pressure women into sex. I just can't even, you know, I have no words for that one. Teens are six times more likely to be sexually aggressive if they are expo exposed to porn. And I would actually say it's 100% <laughs> because I've met the men who have been watching porn all their life. And I've met them in my personal life and they are all aggressive. Even the nice guys turn aggressive uh, around sex. It's, it's quite amazing to watch. Um, sex trafficking, domestic violence, sexual violence, sexual harassment, pedophilia, the dark web, it's, it's just all gone crazy out there. And I just on a side note, please don't put children, pictures of your children up on Facebook. Just please don't, especially if they're in their bathers or if they're naked or if they're having a bath, just stop doing it, right? If you want to share with friends and family, get an Instagram account that's locked down and, and, and has privacy around it. So that's just a side note. Okay, so now to my stuff. That's just the kids and the teens, according to the stats in the newspaper. So I see teens that are masturbating between once a day and 36 times a day. Just let you take that in for a second, right? 36 times a day. When I spoke to this gentleman, he's a 16 year old in America. I actually didn't know how old he was when I did the phone call because I was taking free coaching calls from, from guys who want to like do the program. And, um, you know, he had a very deep voice and, and we spoke and, and I didn't think to ask at that time, you know, how old is this guy? And he was 16. And when he said, I thought he said six times a day. And even then I was like, what? 36 times a day. He's actually in my new book because we need to highlight that this is a massive, massive global health crisis. This kid has massive health injuries and uh, health problems and he's, and he's got impotence and he's only just turned 18 now. Right? So I've been talking to him for a couple of years. 17 year olds are impotent and suicidal. And it's very, very common for this to happen before they leave, before they even leave school. Right? So we're seeing you know, all of your teens have got anxiety issues and mental health issues. All of the boys, right, they've got brain development issues because of porn. I'm going to go through that in a sec, but that's what's happening, right? 22 year olds can't hold erections unless they're touching themselves or watching porn to have to finish themselves off during sex with women. The 27 year olds are all on Viagra. 
um, and uh, they've got impotence and premature ejaculation and they're now taking you know drugs and antidepressants and drinking and, and all of that stuff around their sexual health okay and then you've got the 35 year olds who are all impotent all right they can't get it up without porn um, they can't hold erections they're incredibly stressed under pressure from work they love to, They've, you know, they've just got married and, and the sex has dropped off and, you know, everything's just um, work kind of thing. And there's this massive stress around it. So they're turning to more porn because they can't get erect without it. The 50 to 70 year olds, and I do have clients in their 70s who have been watching porn for 55 years. It's just unfathomable, right? Um, they're all just dead in the water. They're very difficult to actually help those, those guys. They haven't had erections for 20 years, right? Um, and then my last stat is I've never met a man that was impotent for any other reason than porn addiction. A hundred percent of my, my clients that have erectile dysfunction, it is a hundred percent caused by porn and we call that porn induced erectile dysfunction. Okay. So they're my stats, which are pretty grim. Um, and that's why we're here today. And I'm going to ask Holly some questions now just to find out a bit more about, you know, what she does. And then we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty and the, and the brain stuff. Okay. So Holly, when did you start working in this field and where does this passion come from? So I was a teacher assistant working with kids with special needs. And um, even before a program called Protective Behaviours, which is what our program's based on, came to Australia in the late 80s, we always knew kids with special needs were more likely to be abused than mainstream children. Yep. But we'd always taught public and private and things like that. But then protective behaviours came. And I was in one of the first schools trained in the program because there'd been a critical incident at the school. And so all the staff were trained. So for about 25 years, I'd taught it to children that I'd been working with. But then in 2007, I went up into two remote communities here in WA where there was some um, terrible child abuse going on. So in my long service leave, I, I went up and then just saw a huge need for resources. So I quit my job and took a loan out on my home to produce all the resources. Um, but, you know, back then I didn't have to talk to children about pornography. And it wasn't until the good old iPhone came on board, which yeah. was the real, for me, um, you know, that was when it all just went pear-shaped. Um, because, you know, up until then, you know, kids might have looked at a magazine and things like that. But, you know, now when I brainstorm with kids about um, where can you see it, nobody ever says a magazine or a calendar because that's so last century. I oh, know, <laughs> yeah. But so I just um, taught protective education and then just needed to um, build into, so we call it protective education now because we've had to build in about consent. We've had to build in about pornography and um, child to child sex abuse and cyber safety. So protective education is a much more encompassing term, I think. Um, and, you know, I believe that the only way that we're going to combat this is through education because, you know, it's out there. Um, and, you know, people like yourself that um, it's keen to work with teens, that's a huge another area. And, and I'm really glad you're going to do that because um, mm. I have difficulty getting into high schools um, because, you know, science teachers only want to teach science and math teachers only want to teach maths and the poor yeah. old phys ed teacher gets stuck with the sex ed. <laughs> but yeah. nobody wants to, you know, be as, as blunt as both we are. Mm. Um, and so that's, that's how I got into it. Um, yeah. And it's and just morphed from there, basically. Yeah. And do you remember, you know, your first talk in a, in a primary school and, you know, and how did that, how did that go with the, with the kids and with the, with the teachers? Did the kids receive it well? Um, did the, the kids freak out? Were the teachers more uncomfortable than the kids? <laughs> Fair enough, yes. Yeah. Um, I, as you know, I do a lot of work in remote Aboriginal communities and it's hilarious because the kids just sit there, you know, listening to Miss Holly um, and the yeah. teachers and especially the local staff are going, oh my God, that woman said penis, that woman said vagina and they're so horrified because... They're not used to talking, and culturally, yeah. it's not part of their culture to talk as, as openly mm. as I do. They're so grateful at the end of it. Mm. But children, adults tend to overthink things. When I say to adults, you have to talk about pornography from six years of age, people go yeah. straight back to, well, my kid wouldn't look at it, my kid's a good kid, yeah. um, I'm a good parent. 
and then they think about pornography from when they were a child. Yeah. And of course, that's you know, there was no gonzo back when you were a child. No. <laughs> um, yeah. And so they think about the magazine under the big brother's bed or, you know, um, mm. in bed's cupboard or whatever. Mm. And they just don't understand. And, and I know later on we'll get into some of the things that they are seeing, mm. but they don't, they're horrified and they overthink it. Yeah. But if I give a six-year-old the rule, no one's allowed to show you pictures or movies with people private clothes on. If you see pictures like that, you need to go and tell, or actually I, I've changed it. You actually need to go and show an adult what mm. you've seen. Yeah. Now, I, I have to change it because I used to say tell until about two months ago when I had a critical incident where I saw yeah, child really. exploitation. Mm. And from my experience, and um, I won't go into it all now because I'm worried about the time, mm. but I on Instagram saw these horrendous, this horrendous video. I went and told my husband exactly what I'd seen. And I think I'm quite articulate. Mm. And he's gone, oh, yeah, you know, like, big deal. And I'm still having yeah. that. Mm. And so as horrible as it was, it was actually a gift for me because I'm, you know, I talk about this stuff all the time. And if I'm having flashbacks, I'm, you know, my husband doesn't understand that I'll just spontaneously burst into tears. Mm. Mm. And... Yeah. I told him. And so if a child just goes and tells the parent, oh, I saw a movie with people with no clothes on, and they yeah, that's it. not what they saw. Mm. So we really need to yeah. have the child show an adult what they've seen mm. so that the parent can unpack it. Yeah. But yeah. if you say to a kid, if you see pictures of movies with people with no clothes on, tell a grown-up. Yeah. It's not scary. You're not, you know, yeah. frightening them. And it's not just porn. It's if you see some... Um, violence or horror as well mm. because you know cyber trauma um, is yeah. a whole nother area that we you know needs to be looked at and I think that's part of the problem and you and I have had conversations about this before and done interviews around sex education for kids um, and how there is a massive I mean when we grew up there was nothing except for one video that just had little sperm and egg cartoons and it was called where do I come from and they weren't even humans I don't think in the in the actual they were like Pac-Man or something um, you know and that's that's what I've grown up with and we didn't get it from our parents and, and the, the stuff we did get at the at high school was all um, scientific it was all biology how's a baby made so for my whole life, I remember thinking, you know, I can't get pregnant. I've got to, I'm going to get pregnant if I have sex. You know, we just didn't know about this stuff. And they, and because it was a Catholic school, we weren't allowed to talk about protection or there was a suggestion box that never, ever got <laughs> answered because all of our questions were around erections, um, um, uh, contraception, like all of the things that we actually didn't understand. Um, and, you know, some of the people were actually having sex and, we, and I was confused thinking, how are you doing this when you don't even know, you know, how to do it. So it's really, really vital um, that parents educate their kids around sex, but not, not so much sex at a, at a young age. Like you don't have to talk about how babies are made. Like what about their bodies and, you know, which hole does the urination come out of and which hole is your vagina and which, and the correct names for everything. And that's a big one. That is so important. Yeah. And still, you know, we think we're so evolved. Yep. Yeah. And wet dreams for young boys and discharge yeah. for young girls and periods. And, you know, we were just handed a pack of pads and said, now you can have babies at like 12 or 13. And we we're like, what? What is going on? So it's really vital that um, everyone that's listening today has those conversations from a very young age. As soon as your kids are staring at your body parts in the shower and they're asking you, you know, what they are and what they do, please tell them, <laughs> you know, we, we have so many adults running around with no sex education. They don't know about consent and boundaries. They don't understand what orgasms are. There are women out there that haven't had orgasms or they don't masturbate and they don't understand. And it's almost like there are um, children caught in adults' bodies who are taking their clothes off and getting intimate with people, sometimes multiple, multiple, multiple people, not even understanding, you know, um, about their bodies and how those functions work. So, um, you know, and I think that the biggest misconception these days is of parents is that 
the porn, if they don't watch porn, right, there's a lot of dads out there that do and they don't get involved in the conversation anyway because it, it's all too awkward. But the mums, let's say, right, are doing their sex education, let's say, and the mums haven't seen porn for, you know, 30 years and, and all they've done is seen a magazine of their uncles or their dads or something back when they were young. You need to understand that the porn that is out there now is nothing like the porn that was around in the 80s, right? Or the 90s even, right? So the internet came about in 1991 and since then, things are absolutely crazy. And I remember back then, we used to have to, because um, we'd get on there, you know, boobs, we'd Google boobs and the, and the, the um, you know, the, um, the modem would fire up and you'd get that noise and everything. And you couldn't actually, Google wasn't around then, and you couldn't actually um, go into a site, a pornography site, without a credit card, right? That was back then. <laughs> this is now. And you can put porn blockers, right, on your kids' phones. You can do that, right? And that's a whole other conversation. However, if they go into Google or YouTube, it doesn't, it doesn't block it. All right. And I don't know, I ask men constantly, where is it that you go on and find your porn? Like, cause every single, these men are not watching a different DVD or the same DVD from 1991, or like every day they are looking for new material every single day. A lot of them aren't on paid websites. They are literally going into Google and finding the information there. All right. So if, if your kids have access to Google, they have access to porn. And they have proven that every single word in the English language, if you type it in, including the, you will, it will come up with porn on, on Google. So please, parents, be, know that the violence and sexual violence and rape and um, degradation and, and all of that stuff that's happening out there, um, nearly in every single video, which brings me to an interesting fact that we talked about the other day. Have anyone seen the, I haven't seen it, yet uh, i don't really want to watch it but 365 days on netflix now yesterday my daughter said to me we were looking for something to watch on netflix and unfortunately since we've had a chat we've had um i've had something come up personally around it and uh she said to me oh i um so and so one of her friends said um there's this good show called she said it was like 365 something and i was like oh my god and it's only that you told me what was in there you know forced oral tears, black eyes, um, you know, um, BDSM, all of that stuff. And it's, and it's mainstream on Netflix and the kids have been watching it. And you tell me what you've, you've heard about this in terms of what the kids are doing with, you know, they're taking it to school and whatever. Well, yeah, ironically, I, I did a training just yes last night and at a school and I happened to mention it to the teachers there because, um, I'm hearing that kids even in primary school are taking their phones to show the Netflix movie. Yeah. Um, but several of the parents, uh, several of the teachers who are parents of 14 year olds said, you know, they've had very open conversations with their, um, their children. And yes, it's, it's the, you know, it's the thing to do at lunchtime now at school is to watch it. Mm. And, yeah. um, you know, they were describing to me how grateful they were because I trained them last year and this was just a top up to give them some resources. Um, because they'd had, they, from my training last year, they'd had the language to be able to talk to them. And they said, you know, their children were um, describing how other kids were saying, oh, yeah, but every girl likes that. And, oh, yeah, you know, um, mm. they're just so, you know, it's just normalising. Yep. You know, at one stage, he's got the girl's head forced into a pillow and, mm. you know, his every shot when they're having sex, he's choking her. Yeah. And the teenagers are going, oh, well, well do that women what like sex that? And, yeah. yeah. And they but they, just, they don't even question, do women like that? Because they don't know to qu have that question because they don't know what women are <laughs> at that age, you know? They don't understand. It's just what they see. Oh, that's what sex is. That's it. At that simplified level, that's what sex is. And I, they just go and do it. And unfortunately, again, personally, we've been affected in my family by um, child on child sexual abuse. And it was because this child was, was we think, um, exposed to pornography. And he was acting things out on my daughter um, that he was seeing, you know, in porn. And this is really, really common. Um, I've spoken to teachers. I've spoken to you about this stuff. Um, you know, and the stats are, are huge. And Sakaza, which is the sexual... Um, 
I forget what the sex Sakaza stands for, but it's, it's sexual counselling for kids. Um, and that's the Victorian one. And, you know, their stats are coming through huge. But a lot of this stuff doesn't make it to Sakaza or the police. The police couldn't do anything about our situation because the, the child was under 10 years old. We even went to court about it and it's still nothing was done about it because the child was under 10 years old. So, you know, you need to understand that it's not just the act of the kids watching the pornography that's like, oh my God, my kid's seen porn. I, you know, I need to let them know that, 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 you know, there's, there's no reality in that in terms of how you treat women and have sex and stuff. This is, this is way bigger than, oh my God, my child's seen porn. What do I do? Right. Because these kids are acting out. I spoke to someone last week who's, uh, 11 year old was actually staying home and watching porn while she was working during COVID. And it was uh, a difficult conversation to have um, because she didn't actually see the problem in it. She was more like, oh my God, my child's seen porn. What do I do? And I'm like, okay, well, you need to do this, this and this. And, and she wasn't prepared to do those things. So, you know, this is where um, things are getting very tricky because the males in the family are watching porn and they have porn addictions. The, the females or the parent, the, the mum doesn't necessarily understand what, what porn is out there and what these kids are being exposed to. And there's a shame and embarrassment with, with parents who are um, scared to actually have those conversations. But once they do it, they're like, Phew, that's done, you know, move on. And it's like, hang on a second. Um, so my question, next question is, what is the worst case of pornography use in, in children that you've actually come across? Um, children um, acting it out on other children. I, I was rung up about a, a critical incident that happened um, where eight-year-olds had been watching um, pornography and had used sticks on a, on another, on a four-year-old. Sticks. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's just... You know, words fail me, to be honest, because um, it's monkey see, monkey do. Absolutely. Um, I, I felt I had to write a book about child-to-child -child sexual abuse because, as you said, it's um, mm. 400 times more. Yeah. Um, I had a principal contact me. He'd um, The two months prior to him ringing me, he had had six separate cases of child-to-child -child in his school, all different ages. Yeah. The, not on each other, all isolated, but when the Department of Child Protection investigated every case, it led back to the children having seen porn. Mm. Mm. Yep. So, so, know, so I interviewed, um, I've actually got someone watching now, who's, um, his name is John, and he, I believe, he's an American man, and I'm going to interview him in the next couple of weeks. And he's a therapist that has seen more... Um, sexual offenders in America than any other therapist. And we had a very interesting chat the other day and I actually was um, coughing and dry reaching when I got off the phone call to him because of, you know, the energy and stuff that I pick up on. So um, it's a hundred percent of porn causes sex offenders, right? There, there's not a serial killer or a sex offender out there or a, a pedophile or any that has, this has not stemmed from watching pornography at an early age. And if that doesn't scare you, I, you know, for your children, you think, oh, what are they going to be when they grow up? Well, how are they going to treat people <laughs> when they grow up? What gift am I giving my kids to be able to be good people? You know, for the boys to treat the girls right, we've got a massive problem. Even though the, it's mainly the boys that are watching porn, the girls are coming through um, as teens, watching it way more than, you know, say my generation. Um, and it's about a third of women that watch porn, according to Pornhub. Well, that's, that, that's just their stats. Um, you know, obviously there's other sites and things, but, um, the girls are watching it because of the, that's just the done thing. You know, the boys are watching it. They're expecting anal behind the shelter shed at school or oral before these kids have even kissed each other. Um, before there's been any consent or any, anything, it's just expected. Um, this is what we do. And, and this is normal. And, and these kids, these girls, are, you know, I, there was stuff in my last book around how girls are being treated and how um, it's just so degrading. And, and the worst part, the worst part about all of this is the girls actually think that that's normal. Uh, and that's what's expected of them. They have no self-esteem, no self-worth, no self-respect. You can go to any shopping center and you can actually see 
what porn is actually doing to our teens in terms of the way that they dress and the way that they act. Um, I can go to a pub and I can tell you who's watching porn and who's not by the way that they're interacting with women. Um, same with dating sites. It's, it's, it's just everywhere. Um, and, it, and it's really, really horrendous. Okay, so can I ask, is it worse in the rural areas, do you think, that you work in? And just tell us a little bit. So that's Aboriginal communities. Um, to be honest, even communities that don't have mobile coverage, mm. when I do a brainstorm with the kids about where my kids see pictures or moves with people no clothes on, yep. children usually say a USB stick because um, they'll go into a, a regional centre where there is mobile coverage and the teenagers are downloading porn on USB sticks mm. and then taking it back into the community and they can just watch it on the TV. And, and the teenagers are actually swapping them like baseball cards. Yeah. Yep. So it's, you know, it's like you said earlier, it's totally, when I'm working with 14 year olds, doesn't matter if it's in mainstream or in remote communities, when I say to teenage young fellas, why would you look at that? The same, it's always the same response. Hmm. Oh, we want to learn technique, miss, we want to learn style. Well, let me stop you right there. Because we're failing in sex education. Yep. And, you know, in my experience, all we're doing is STIs and unwanted pregnancy. Oh, all the doom and gloom. Like, where's the stuff on orgasm? Yeah, <laughs> pleasure, you know. Yeah, pleasure, <laughs> consent, partners. like love, connection, you know, relationships. Yeah. yeah. So... I think the problem in the remote communities is there's even less um, sex education being done. Yeah. Um, and also um, boredom, you know, so they, you know, I know during and COVID um, of older kids showing younger kids um, pornography and um, also yeah. the older kids videoing the younger kids on TikTok to get the likes when they're naked and things like that. So yeah, um, it's just... I mean, yeah. it, it infiltrates everywhere, yeah. unfortunately. I've just, um, there's been a bit of um, comments going on <laughs> that I'm just watching. One man in particular has been um, on there. And John, thank, thank you, John, for actually addressing some of the stuff um, that he's saying. He's saying, you know, um, this is all bullshit. Your stats are wrong. Calm down. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, and then, you know, there's one comment here. Men treat women better in 2020 than any previous years in history. I would say that is absolutely incorrect and only a woman will be able to answer that for you. <laughs> um, I've been single for 12 years and on the dating scene and I can tell you right now, I haven't been on a date for two years because of how horrendous it is out there um, in the market, let's, let's call it, the way that, you know, there's plenty of men doing men's work and they're evolving and they're great and there's lovely husbands and, you know, all of that is, is amazing. We're not trying to take away from men and I'm definitely not a man hater because I, you know, I work with these guys, but to think that women are being treated better in 2020 is, is just, it's, it's just not true at all. Um, he's questioning my, um, you know, my stats and everything and, you know, all of the information. So uh, we've just got one question here. Uh, John just wants to know, can you ask Holly Ann has ever seen a child who was sexually victimized, who made it well into his or her teens without manifesting noteworthy symptoms? Well, to be honest, we don't um, follow that. We don't track their progress. Oh, no, unfortunately, the way I, I can probably do, answer that. <laughs> could yeah. you spend more time long term with children, whereas I go in and teach the program, and then yeah require the teachers to continue it. Yeah. So I'll go into my stuff now because it seems appropriate to, to um, go into that because I see men who it's, it's very, very common. I must say for men um, in, you know, at, of any age, mainly it, I think it's the older guys that have actually been exposed to porn at a very young age. And then there'll be the, the teens that come through now. Um, but they were all exposed to um, porn between the age of five and 10. All right, so that's very, very, very common. And I'm not just saying they saw something and it was a magazine, you know, like the first time I saw porn, there was a magazine being thrown over the fence um, and landed in the duck pond and we found it and we dried it out at the front and we got caught actually looking at it and we ran off and we didn't come back for the rest of the day because there was so much shame around, you know, getting caught by mum and dad. We're not talking about these, these men aren't just seeing it once they're then seeking it out. And a lot of the times, and I ask lots of questions of these guys, these, um, 
these materials, whether it's v, VHS or DVD or magazines or, you know, now it's a little bit different because it's just everywhere. But um, it was given to them by a friend um, or a parent or, or an uncle. It was actually given to them. They didn't just find this stuff, right? And then they started masturbating at that age. <laughs> I cannot tell... They're not even meant to ejaculate until, you know, a certain age. And these kids have been masturbating. One was masturbating at age five and he didn't start ejaculating until he was eight. And his father actually um, encouraged him and his sister to watch porn at, you know, at this early age. It was a men's health magazine or something, you know, like that. It, start, it just starts to phase in, right? That's the, that's the kid that's been watching porn 36 times a day. He's only 18 now, and that's the introduction that he had. But plenty of guys have been introduced at a really young age. Um, and I, I see also men that have been sexually abused as well. So there's plenty of um, victims, if you like, of sexual molestation, um, uh, humiliation, you know, a once-off incident or, you know, grooming as well. And I work with these men um, and most of them haven't actually told anyone. And they come in and I, I had a man waiting at my front doorstep. When I opened the door, he was 65 and he was um, absolutely hysterically crying and, I, and leaning up against the wall. And I had to try and get him in the, in the, and he said, I was raped at age 20. And that was it. He couldn't talk. And he came in the door and he hadn't told anyone. Right? So I get this all the time. And I've, you know, I've never met anyone that it, it's always porn related. Always. I've researched Al, um, not Al Bundy. What's his name? <laughs> Bundy, the serial killer, and the oh, Ed Bundy, yeah, yeah, Bundy, not Al Bundy. Bundy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a YouTube clip of him admitting that. Um, That's it. He's you know, blaming. Yeah, and I and since that day, I've actually um, watched the um, the uh, documentaries about him, and also researched a number of other serial killers. And it always comes back to them being exposed at porn at a really young age. Now, does porn cause you to become a serial killer? No, right, but. It, it sets them on a path, and I'm going to explain that path in a sec, that, that completely changes the direction in life, right? So a lot of men come to me and I, and, and I say, are you experiencing this? What's happening with that? Blah, blah, blah. And we go through it all. And, and they don't know any different because they've never, ever been, um, had a life that isn't under the influence of porn. It's always been there in their life. Before they ever had sex, this porn was around, right? Now, my next book has some really raw stories in it from other people. So porn guys that have had porn addictions, uh, women or partners that have had to deal with, you know, relationships where this was present. And also my heartfelt stuff about, you know, some men that were amazing men, but the first time we had sex, they tried to choke me. They were slapping me. They were spitting on me. You know, these were men that um, I would absolutely adored. And, you know, to this man that's actually commenting on this thing saying, you know, it's not all men, but never said it was all men. Um, the stats I have stated today are about uh, erectile dysfunction and the amount of men that are watching porn. But porn addiction always, always, always turns into something else. Always. It has to because it's got nowhere to go, right? And I'll explain that now. Okay, so what is a porn addiction? So uh, many, many people will contact me and say, I'm not addicted or anything, but, um, you know, I wouldn't mind having a chat. How many times a, day, a week are you watching porn? Oh, it's only like two to three. Two to three is in the severe end of porn addiction. Okay, so the way that I define, define porn addiction, I've been doing this for a very long time and I don't need a textbook to tell me these things. However, the textbook definition of an addiction is if you can't go without something for a month, that's your phone, that's coffee, that's Coke, I'm addicted to Coke, <laughs> um, all of these things, um, drugs, alcohol, obviously, um, gambling, gaming, all of the things, if you can't go a whole month without you know, something, then you have an addiction. That is the textbook psychological definition of addiction. Okay. Now, if you're watching porn once a month or more, you have an addiction and I'll explain, obviously there's a scale there. Once a month is, is on the, you know, at the low end of the scale. And then we've got the guys watching it, you know, multiple times a day, 36 times a day is at the very end. And I don't, I doubt I'll ever meet anyone that actually um, goes over that, that line. Now, I'll give an example. A 71-year-old came to see me and his wife had passed away a few years ago and he was masturbating once a month. He had erectile dysfunction and other things going on that were signs of porn addiction. And I said to him, I'm sorry, you have a porn addiction. And he's like, no, 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 no. How is that possible? I only watch it once a month. When was the last time you masturbated without porn? And he couldn't remember. It was like 20, 30 years or something like that. 
right? So if you are watching porn every single time you masturbate, it does not matter how often you're masturbating, then you have a porn addiction. But as a general rule, we say once a month or more is a porn addiction. Now, what is a porn addiction? It is when the brain gets addicted to itself. This is not a sex addiction. And I will put almost put money on it, almost. If I had a lot of money, I would put a lot of money on it. <laughs> that um, 100% of sex addiction cases are porn addiction turned into something else because I've never met a guy that had a sex addiction that didn't have a porn addiction first. We always look at what happened first. Was it a drug addiction first, alcohol addiction or sex addiction or porn? And it's always porn because it was there from a very young age. And a lot of psychologists will start t piping in on this conversation and say, well, you know, they, they turn to porn because of things going on in their life. Um, and it's, it's, it's normally not that unless you've got a, a parent handing you magazines at age five, it's normally the porn comes first, then the addiction, and then the triggers to actually turn to porn more and more and more on the mental health side of things. So your brain gets addicted to itself. It releases when you watch porn, a whole lot of chemicals and hormones that flood your body, make your heart rate go up. You've got skin tingles, you've got things going on in the back of your neck and, and goosebumps and stuff. And you feel super, super horny. And for a young kid, that's like, what is this feeling? They don't even know what this is. They know they're interested in girls and they're, 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 you know, all of a sudden there's changes in their body, but they don't understand what this sexual energy is, right? So porn increases that by a million fold. It's like a fireworks display goes off in the brain. It's oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine. Dopamine is the addictive one. It's the novelty drug. Um, I like what I see and I want to see more of this, right? This is why we're addicted to our phones because there's a dopamine, tiny little dopamine hit every time that little red number pops up, right? So they've got this um, addiction. It's almost to the adrenaline side of things, right? And the dopamine actually kicks in before the session. It's not just during porn that they're, they're, they're experiencing these chemical rushes. It's um, a little bit different for teens, but for a man, it's like when he's driving home from work and he knows that his wife's not going to be home or this is when he usually masturbates, right? So that's when it starts to kick in. Oxytocin is the love drug. It's, it's women feel... Um, uh, women get um, high levels of oxytocin in their body after, shortly after giving birth. And that's for the bonding side of things, right? So it's, it's, it's not just sex crazed men that are feeling oxytocin, right? It's the love drug. The women and the men are both feeling it when they're making love, right? So this oxytocin is the bonding hormone though. So the men are actually bonding to the acts that they're watching. And the subconscious mind is a part of the mind that if, if you're having a chemical reaction to something, you might be crying at a movie. You might be thinking about, um, you know, losing your own family when there's a car accident on the movie or something. You know, it's resonating with you and you're actually feeling the emotions and there's chemicals going. So that's what emotions are, they're chemicals. And your brain is starting to, you know, flutter and you start to cry. That's a reaction to what you're watching. Now, men are having those reactions to form. Therefore, the subconscious mind says, thinks that you've actually experienced it. So if, let's take a man who's 50, who's been watching it for, you know, 30, 40 years, and he's watched, you know, a million little um, scenes of, of sex, he's not going to want to have normal sex with his partner because his body is so used to reacting to all of these crazy levels of hormones and things in his body. And his subconscious mind thinks he's actually been there, done that, all right? So that's the oxytocin. That is what men withdrawing from sex that's what's happening out there now. The men are withdrawing from their partners and it's because of the oxytocin. They're getting a bigger hit, drug hit in the brain from having, you know, watching porn than they are having sex. And if you take a 20, 30, 40 year marriage where people aren't, you know, the intimacy is dying off anyway, you've got no chance of rekindling that if, if your partner is watching porn. Okay, oxytocin. Now, the serotonin is the, um, the happy hormone. So um, someone who has uh, depression will have low serotonin, let's say. All right, so is serotonin is the happy hormone. And so you get to feel happy, you get to feel bonded, you get to feel loved, and you get to feel excitement and pleasure then if you're masturbating as well. So this is what porn gives a man. But the brain cannot accommodate for all these extra chemicals and hormones. It's exactly the same as a drug addiction. If you took cocaine or heroin every single day for a week, you would be addicted, same as porn. Now, people don't see it like that. There's like, oh, how can porn be that bad? But if I was sitting here talking about ice, or heroin, or everyone be like, ooh, yeah, no, you know, you can't be addicted to those things. I'm telling you right now, the damage in the brain is exactly the same as a drug addiction, and it only takes a week of watching it every single day. So if you think 
that your teenagers, oh, they'll watch a bit of porn here and there, whatever. They will be addicted within a week and this will ruin their lives. I'm telling you right now because of the men that I treat, all right? So you've got this chemical concoction going and the brain is starting to rewire itself because it can't accommodate for all those extra chemicals and hormones. So it starts to adapt and rewire, rewire out neural pathways. Neural pathways are like little programs in the brain where they say, um, when I feel shit at school because everyone's picking on me or when my parents are fighting, I masturbate and watch porn to, to feel amazing and then I feel everything's going to be okay after that. That's a neural pathway. Now, kids' brains are still developing up to the age of 25. <laughs> So these kids, their brain is still developing, yet it's changing before they've even left high school. And this is why they're having problems with concentration, focus, and all of that. So the brain is starting to um, adapt and get addicted to its own chemicals because it then requires that level of stuff coming into it, right? So then you've got the hit, what we call the hit of all those chemicals and hormones. They also get opiates, flood their body, and they get tunnel vision. So if mum's walking down the hallway and they're already masturbating, they're going to finish before, you know, or an earthquake starts, it's tunnel vision. I've got to get this job done, right? Because the opiates and everything in that tunnel just feel amazing. This is why kids with autism, ADHD, anxiety and depression, and men as well, will watch way more porn than, and masturbate than, you know, let's say someone who doesn't have those, those mental health issues, okay? So um, this hit crash, the crash is exactly the same as a drug addiction as well. And it's a crash of all those, you know, wow, chemicals, and then bang, down, flooded, gone. Then prolactin goes up. Prolactin causes in, uh, impotence. So you've got all of these, you know, rush, hit, crash, hit, crash, hit, crash. Now, there's a whole lot of other stuff that happens as well. When a man ejaculates, he loses his chi, which is his life force energy, right? Guys are really tired after they ejaculate. And kids are drained and exhausted from doing this, okay? Gaming is the same thing. Gaming is the same. It's not the genital stuff, but it's the hit, crash, hit, crash, hit, crash. They get the high while they're there and then crash and they'll be tired, right? So you've got to watch the brain, um, brain damage with gaming as well. So it affects, when I keep saying brain damage, it affects the frontal lobe of the brain, which is your concentration, focus, uh, decision-making behaviours, sexual behaviours, emotional expression. So all those men out there who can't actually express themselves, guess what? You've got brain damage at the frontal lobe. So you can't actually do that. And I treat many, many men who come in here and don't understand what I'm talking about when I talk about certain emotions. They've got no compassion, um, and they hate it, right? These aren't assholes, but they, they have no compassion or empathy or sympathy for their partners because they're having these arguments and they, they're like, I don't understand what, how you're actually feeling. They, they can't you know, connect with that. Um, you've got decrease in the, in the gray matter, which is your motor neuron skills, your um, nervous system and, and the way that the body moves. Um, that you'll see a brain scan on some of my posts where a heroin brain is in better shape than a porn addict brain. And that's a, and that's a fact. So for the man who's doubting me all the way through there on the comments, you go on to Google and you just have a look. And there's, I've been re reading research studies the last few days, which are doing my head in because the way they're written. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's all there. The information is there and it's been proven many, many times, but no one is actually filtering it down to these men. So back to ejaculation, you lose your chi, you lose your life force energy. Your chi is, is the, we're all made up of um, electrons, neurons, atoms. It doesn't matter which culture you come from. Um, it's energy, it's, it's um, chi, it's jing, it's life force energy, all right? When you, it's in your semen, it's in your bloodstream. So you lose chi when you lose your ejaculation. You also lose all the nutrients and minerals that are responsible for keeping your prostate healthy. <laughs> I cannot... Tell, I cannot shout this enough. Doctors are telling guys, old, older guys, to masturbate to keep their prostate healthy. They are telling you that to clean out the pipes, all right? But all of the nutrient, nutrients and minerals that it contain in semen are to keep your, uh, the inflammation down in your prostate, all right, and to keep it healthy. If you lose, you will lose zinc every time you ejaculate, and it's half your daily intake of zinc lose, lost in one ejaculation. We do not make zinc in our body. You have to get it from an external source or take, you know, as supplements or food. So these, all these men that have porn addiction have zinc deficiencies 
And when you have a zinc deficiency, you end up with a copper toxicity. So all of these teenagers that are masturbating like the clackers, right? They're watching porn every single day. They're literally flogging a dead horse in a lot of cases because they're, they're losing, I love my terms, <laughs> losing their erections already, right? They're losing their nutrients. Their health is being affected. Um, they're losing energy and their sexual energy is actually going down as well. Sexual energy is your life force energy and we call it kundalini in the, in the base of your spine, right? Sexual energy is organic. It's um, smelling flowers or perfume or the sun's out or it's a Friday night and it's beer o'clock and everyone's dressed up and, you know, that's natural sexual energy or talking to someone you really like and you like can't wait to see them and stuff. We're not talking about sexting, by the way. <laughs> so that's natural. Other video. Yeah, that's a whole other video. Natural sexual energy is that, right? Brain addiction to porn is not sexual energy and men that watch porn have no sexual energy and when they stop, stop watching porn, they have no erections, they have no sexual energy, they're not interested in their partners, they're not interested in masturbating uh, and it was, it was like that all along but they were actually masturbating to porn on this you know, hit crash, hit crash cycle which they couldn't actually stop. And it makes them feel better. They're like, oh, I masturbated. Oh, I've got such a high sex drive. You don't have a high sex drive. You have a hit crash situation. You have a drug addiction in your brain. Okay? So that's how it works. So if you think that, oh, my kid's seen porn, you need to check in. How often are they watching it? Do they have access to it? Are they watching it regularly? 17-year-olds are all watching porn, right? So you need to, to somehow step in with, this type of education, I have a free ebook I can share with you, and my other book is based, um, aimed at teens and parents for this reason, so that they can read it as well, because there are some frightening stories and stats, and if they don't understand how this works, why would they ever stop? Because the number one thing men say to me is, I love watching porn. Great. People love smoking as well. I love chocolate. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's good for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's get straight down to the what can parents do now, Holly? What do we, how can they help? How can they educate their kids? How, if, let's, say, let's say a parent never had a conversation with their child at all and the child is, you know, say 10 or 11 or 12 and starting to, what's your advice for these parents? Well, like I say, I'd say started at six. And um, so when I'm talking with six to 10 year olds, just like you've done there, I actually do brain science and brain science, six year olds love brain science. Yes. I don't <laughs> go quite as much into the serotonin and the other things, but I do talk about the dopamine. Yeah, great. I explain to children that in your brain, you've got all these connections, millions and millions of connections. Yeah. But if you see those pictures, pictures or movies with people no clothes on, it changes the connections in your brain. It rewires your brain. And it releases a chemical in your brain called dopamine. Yep. And so I say, you know, and our body loves dopamine. So if I'm eating chocolate, my brain will create a little bit of chocolate to say, keep eating chocolate. If I'm running around, a little bit of dopamine to say, hey, keep running around. I like that feeling. But I explain, if you see pictures or movies like that, it's like this flood of dopamine in your brain and your brain loves it. Yep. So even if you see something that goes, Ugh, yuck, you'll still go back and look at it. Yeah. So what I, I, I try and give kids some some strategies so um i say if you see naked pictures if it's on an ipad i need you to flip it over ready to go and tell a grown-up but i want you to say that's private out loud and turn away and it's like turning off the dopamine tap mm. but you have to go and show someone um and then yeah. i also explain that you can't unsee something and because kids are describing flashbacks and things like that I tell them, you know, to close your eyes and make a picture in your mind of something that you see or you like to do so that if that picture pops in your mind that, you know, you can't unsee it, but you can train your brain not to think about that terrible thing. Because, yeah. you know, when kids are describing having nightmares from what they've seen mm. um, and, you know, kids in, in grade four, so they're nine and ten, yeah. know about red shoes. And they yep. know about zoo tube. And for those people who don't know about either of those, red tube is just average people having sex and videoing it and putting it up. Um, and then they're learning about a thing called zoo tube on, I 
from what kids tell me, they're learning about it from a show called a show called Family Guy. And so the cartoon characters go blah blah blah, and then on YouTube, because they're going to go YouTube, YouTube, Google it, hit search, nine boxes are going to yep. open up with people having sex with animals. Mm. There's no are you 18? This is adult content. There is no warning. Yeah. And you can't take that back. Mm. So you know, parents think, oh, if I talk to my kid about this, it'll turn it on to them onto it. It's, yeah. You know, there is so much evidence to say mm. especially around sex education you know you look at holland where they have the best sex education in the world mm. they have the lowest teen pregnancy in the world it doesn't make them go to it i know that's a perception that parents are like i'll, I'll over sex my child if i tell them how to have sex and it's like um no so my daughter comes to me every time she sees something on instagram that's untoward let's say and i get a lot of them online and 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 i say right what do we do we report and then and then we block thank you for showing me and you know these people are following her on either tiktok or instagram so she's you know she's very vigilant with that um and that's kind of i believe how you i mean obviously i've had sex education talks with her and stuff and she she knows i'm a porn addiction specialist and we and you know we talk about it a lot um in terms of you know her age group and she tells me what happens at school and what the boys are saying and and all of these things um you know so i've had first-hand experience with you know what what's happening at, at that age and she's now you know 13 so um but it's the, the the kids on instagram that worry me and um they have uh i don't know if anyone knows what no fap is no fap um means no masturbation right so americans call it fapping so no fap is is this um movement that's happening started in america billions of men are following it um, but what I didn't realize was these kids actually have these no fap accounts set up. So they'll, you know, they'll say, Oh, I did 21 days without porn and masturbation. And then I relapsed and, um, you know, there's, there's shame and there's mental health issues and there's health issues and, and, and all these other people who are men are jumping on who all have these no fap accounts and are jumping on and just, you know, giving each other advice around this. And, and it worries me because, um, they don't know what they're talking about. And it's very clear. Even the no fat movement is not how you quit porn. And they don't, you know, they've got kind of the right idea there. Um, but these kids are following this. I mean, if they're already addicted and following a, 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 a therapy or a modality to actually stop this from happening at age 13, where was the, you know, the intervention from the parents? Now, I... I know my, my friend, my, my daughter's friends often think I'm a bit mean because I've got really strong boundaries and I don't let her, um, you know, occasionally if I see her upset, I tell her to show me her phone and I see what the conversations are that are going on there. And we talk about it for hours and we work out the, the plan of attack and who said what and what's going to happen and blah, blah, blah. Whereas other parents aren't monitoring their, their children. They're not, um, I'm not micromanaging her at all. Um, I'm not a helicopter parent, but if I see her or feel that she's upset, I, I investigate and we, we use it as a learning experience, you know? Um, and, and the kids, the boys have been asking the girls, you know, do you do this? Can I do that? All of these sexual questions. And I remember that happening to us in primary school. The boys were asking us, do you come? In primary school, we, I went to the teacher. I was so embarrassed because I didn't know what it meant. And I asked the teacher because they just kept asking us. There were frigid tests where you had to stand still and the boys would run their finger from here down here and go through the middle of your body. And, and it depended on, you know, um, where you stopped of how frigid you were. Like we, we have been set up in society for women to be abused basically and the me too movement and the toxic masculinity around porn addiction is everything that's what's in my my new book and it covers all of the domestic violence increases in kids so the teens are coming through um attacking their parents and then they go on to have relationships and they're attacking their partners as well so you know there's domestic violence sexual violence all of these other things that are all you know interweaved into this into this problem is um you know is where i'm at and and this is why we're having this conversation with holly today to try and bring that in together and, and to go back to consent everything yeah. comes down to consent yeah. you know i i talk about i would not pick up a baby you know, from about nine months old, if somebody was holding a baby, I'd say, can I have a cuddle? If they put it out their arms, I'd take them. If they turned their back, I wouldn't take them. 
we need to model that. We need to yes. explicitly teach it because you're so right. Um, when I did this talk yesterday afternoon, one of the teachers was telling me about her daughter's best friend. Mum looked at her phone mm. and she was best, had this boy as a best friend and, and then they were talking about, you know, that movie mm. and he was saying, oh, I'd like to do that to you. And then the mother said, oh, you know, wow. having this conversation. She yep. said, but, but mum, I don't want to upset him. Yeah. You know, it's, we, there's so much education that needs doing. So yeah. okay. the, greatest, the yeah. greatest gift parents will give their kids is teaching them the concept of consent. Absolutely. Consent and boundaries. Like we were talking the other day, if, if you're waking up to your partner touching your genitals, there is no consent, right? Some people might like that. I don't like that. And I think it's a massive, there are so many things to teach your kids in terms of boundaries, consent and non-sexual as well. It yeah, doesn't it's have not to about be. Sex. Yeah. It's, it's all that. about boundaries and not having, you know, they, they taught my daughter um, in Sakaza how to say no. That was the biggest thing of actually how to say no to an adult, to a teacher, to a group of people, to a teacher, to actually say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not okay with that. Um, and that's really important. And I think, um, you know, parents should get a lot out of this talk today because either directly or indirectly, um, you know, we've got some resources that um, we can share with you as well. So Holly, you've got uh, a number of books. Oh, there they are. Oh, I need my books. <laughs> I just have my feathers. Oh, that placement. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Holly's got some books that you can actually buy and we'll put the links up on, um, on our, uh, on, in the comments of this live and also in the recording when we, when we set that up for replay. I, I have, have an online parent course about the whole program yep. because the basis of protective education is consent saying mm -hmm. no and also when you're talking about saying no we need to be able to hear no and not yeah. take it personally you know yeah. it's it's not a rejection of you it's just it might not be convenient now yeah. so that's a two-way street so you know the if we can lay the foundations of protective education talking about early warning signs talking about a safety team of people if you can't talk to your parents about your born addiction you know so the foundation of protective education just builds on all of this stuff yeah. that we've been talking to. So yeah. And I'm looking at looking at um, with my new book is hopefully setting up a not for profit um, or a charity organization around that where the, the profits of the book actually go to that so that we can set up um, some kind of um, scholarship program for teens, um, retreat kind of boot camp type stuff where it's like a weekend um, or even just, you know, some counselling therapy sessions with them, um, obviously with, with the parents' consent. But this is the problem. The, the kids, every single one that I talk to, I'm like, in order for me to treat you, I have to have consent from your parents. Um, they can do my program. They can, they can do lots of stuff. Um, but we need that sign off from the parents. That's never going to happen because these kids are not telling their parents. They are already down the rabbit hole. They already have erection issues. They already have massive, massive addictions by the time they're 13. So they're not going to then hand that over to a parent and say, look, I think I've got a problem. But it's too late. It's way too late at age 13, right? So God, you know, who, who would have thought that this would be happening? Um, so I've got a book um, that's only $9.95, uh, which is called what no one told you about pornography and it addresses all of the issues that I've been talking today, including, you know, explaining what um, a porn addiction is. Um, I'll, I'll put the link in the comments. I've got a new book coming out end of October with an, it's actually getting printed. So I'll be able to put it behind me. Like uh, Holly's got hers sitting there. Uh, I have a free book as well, a free ebook. And I have um, some masturbation challenges, which are like mini programs to teach boys and men how to masturbate, we call it conscious, conscious self-pleasure um, and we teach them how to use, um, use their bodies properly without porn and we teach them how to rewire their brains and their behaviours and their neural pathways. So I'll put all of those links in the comments um, and I'm just having a look at these comments here and unfortunately... <laughs> we've got someone, um, that man that's just gone absolutely off and we're going to have to delete him because he's swearing and saying the C-bomb and things like that. But I don't think there's any other questions there. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can pop them and you're watching this later on, you can actually pop them in the comments and we will get back to you. Um, we'll keep a list of all the questions and, and we'll see if we can do another live to, to answer that. 
So thank you, Holly, for your time today. And um, yeah, it's been absolutely amazing. And I hope everyone got a lot out of it. And we'd love to hear your feedback in terms of you know, what you learned today and what your key takeaways were so that we can you know, develop more chats like this for parents. And yeah, please share it. I know it's confronting, but it's the stone in the pond and you're the ripples that can move out and get this out there because you know, it's not being taught in schools and um, you know, we need more education around this sort of stuff. Yeah, beautiful. All yeah. right, thank you very much. Thanks for watching everyone and we'll all talk to you soon. Thank you.